uh, go ahead and share that recording to all attendees, uh, as well as a uh, uh, migration best practices white paper. All attendees are in listen only mode with chat disabled, uh, but we do have a Q&A feature, which I'm gonna do my best to remind you about uh, so that you can uh, ask questions either directly to our panelists, uh, or if it's a question that, uh, that is worth sharing with the group, uh, we're gonna go ahead and ask it to the panel uh, towards the end of this uh, webinar. So the focus of today's webinar is, is specifically on migrations, which many uh, individuals see as, as being a logical progression uh, with cloud adoption rising year over year. Uh, and in the past year with COVID, it certainly accelerated um, uh, cloud adoption and cloud migrations. But individual businesses, it often takes uh, a change agent to kick this process off. Uh, sometimes that's customers demanding um, that, uh, that their applications be served through the cloud. Sometimes uh, organizations look to the cloud for cost savings or to use uh, some of the newer, more innovative services like AI and ML. Whatever the reason for you being interested in cloud, uh, you'll be hearing from uh, the team, Venkit, Connor, Ajay, and Sabari, who all have firsthand experiences making this transition and supporting it. You'll also be hearing about programs, both from AWS and Duplo Cloud, on how they can make it easier for companies to adopt the cloud. Looking at the agenda, we're gonna kick things off with Connor Colgan from AWS, who I'll introduce in just a moment. Venkit Tiro Vengadam, Duplo Cloud's founder and C CEO, will walk through the workflow required across var various types of migrations, as well as provide an introduction to Duplo Cloud. Then we'll hear from Ajay Guadi, CTO of Chemivision, followed by Sabari Balusamaranian, Director of Technology at Steve Lines and Wallpaper. They're gonna share their stories of how they adopted Cloud. The five of us are then gonna come back together for that panel I mentioned to address the Q&A. You'll leave here with a better idea of how AWS and partners such as Duplo Cloud are supporting startups and how this translates for individuals like Ajay and Savari. Now, without delay, I'd like to introduce Connor from AWS. Connor is a solutions architect on the AWS healthcare and life sciences startup team. His focus is on helping startups adopt AWS to help meet their business objectives and accelerate their velocity. He has years of experience with security and compliance on AWS specifically for healthcare, where he has helped companies large and small uh, adopt uh, AWS architectures suited to host and process personal health information. He has designed and built systems that help evaluate, remediate, and demonstrate compliance and security posture on AWS. Over to you, Connor. Thanks, Ian. So today I wanna to spend some time introducing you to AWS and, and talk about AWS in general and how customers uh, have performed successful migrations onto AWS. I'll also spend some time talking about uh, how you can use automation to build a foundation for a successful uh, cloud journey. And then I'll introduce you to a couple of programs that AWS has that can help our customers uh, with that cloud adoption. So to, to start things off, uh, AWS, as you can see, is the cloud computing arm of Amazon.com. And AWS got started when Amazon.com realized that uh, we had over a decade of experience building and operating um, th that uh, Amazon.com retail site and knowing that we've developed a core competency in operating those massive scales of technology and data centers. So then we embarked on a mission to offer this for developers and businesses so they could build sophisticated, modern, and scalable applications. And what this means for you is that everything you'd want in the traditional data center is at your fingertips with the ability to click a button to run applications reliably, security, securely, and at scale. Next slide. So what are some of the advantages of cloud computing? So as we build this out, you can look at uh, the ability to trade capital expenses for variable. Um, and so this allows you to not have to worry about uh, large upfront expenses. You also benefit from massive economies of scale. Um, you know, I talked about how Amazon is able to, uh, after that decades of experience, is able to build that e expansive data center network. And you can benefit that because it can help reduce costs. You also get elasticity in your environment. So you can stop guessing capacity. Uh, you get capacity when you need it and importantly, when you don't. Um, you can also increase your speed and agility. So this helps you increase your team's velocity, allowing your teams to iterate and quickly test new things, even allowing them to fail quicker. Uh, you can also remove the burden of those business data center operations and take advantage of other fully managed services. 
that remove uh, overall undifferentiated heavy lifting. And what this does is it allows you and your teams to focus on what makes your business special. What are your business drivers that uh, can that your customers want? You can it allows you to focus on that. And finally, you can go global in minutes. Amazon has a large network of regions across the world that allow you to expand um, wherever your customers may be. Next slide. So Ian touched about, uh, on this. What are some of the business drivers for migrating to the cloud? There's typically a, some form of events. Now, as we engage with thousands of customers, we've discerned multiple of the reasons and digital transformation remains a top priority, even uh, in this COVID-19 impacted economic times. Some organizations still want to strategically modernize a customer facing or back office process. Um, that helps differentiate the organizations like I talked about before. Development and process agility for current staff and teams, it's also key. You know, this improves the, the team's productivity. Uh, development teams come to cloud uh, almost by default these days. But in these COVID-19 times, economic changes also prioritize cost reductions and optimizations. Um, so that looking to the cloud can actually lower spend uh, compared to on-premises systems and lower overall management costs. Um, standard goals of closing data centers and not running servers are still a key source and a key driver for many. Uh, and a decision to outsource certain applications can also shift to the cloud. And uh, as you contemplate moving or migrating to the cloud, AWS and partners can help give guidance for all of these. Next slide. And I talked a little bit about cost savings, but the migration to AWS really drives value beyond that. Uh, the typical focus is on cost savings and TCO, that, that leftmost column, but the more compelling business drivers are the increase in productivity, overall resilience, and um, an improvement in overall ag agility. According to ICD report in February uh, 2018, customers see an average savings of 31%, but they also see seven times fewer downtime hours, and they see a 62% boost in IT staff productivity. Um, and that all translates to an average of three times more features delivered per year in the cloud than on-premises. And that really shows how you can take advantage of the cloud to drive better business outcomes. Next slide. So looking at how can you get to the cloud? Um, we see this typically as a three-stage process where you assess your current operations and your current footprint. And then looking at mobilizing your workforce as well as your technology to begin that move to the cloud and then actually migrate into the cloud. So during that assess phase, tools are deployed to look at high level discovery of what's on premises or hosted with the goal of determining what the organizational needs are. Then during the mobilize phase, those tools are used to anal uh, analyze the data provided uh, to identify dependencies and risks and then determine the application level strategy. And finally, during migration, there's tools that play a significant role in, in the execution of that migration. Things like Cloud Endure for cloud backups or VMware Cloud on AWS and quite a wide range of services depending on that particular need. And then once you're in the cloud, uh, next slide please, we look at um, a wide breadth of AWS services that provide a really strong foundation for building uh, the right workload to solve your business needs ranging from virtual compute in EC2 on the top to fully managed databases like RDS, uh, RDS Aurora. The services here are built to solve customer needs. And in fact, 90% of our roadmap is driven by customer and customer feedback. And if we look at these core services and, the, and these um, higher level building blocks, we talked about machine learning with Amazon SageMaker and Amazon Comprehend. These were developed to help our customers take further advantage of the scale of the cloud and help them focus on what's special to their business. You know, for example, the suite of machine learning services is growing because our customers are leveraging more and more machine learning to help solve their business challenges and delight their customers. Next slide. So I talked about the AWS going global in minutes. If you look at this map, this is AWS's global footprint. We have 25 regions, uh, 80 availability zones across those regions and more than 230 points of presence across the world to allow you to reach where your customers are. The next slide. And that allows us uh, also to help comply with virtually every regulatory agency. Uh, and that in turn allows customers to do it. So 
Security is considered job zero at AWS. It's the foundation from which we build. And we leverage that culture to help meet regulation requirements that our customers need. And then our customers can take advantage to help with their compliance posture and helps build that strong foundation. So what does that look like relative to on-premises? So if we look here, this is a, sh a shared responsibility model where in the on-premises world, the customer is responsible for the entirety of the stack, including the data center, power, cooling, all the way up to data management and everything in between. If we go to the next slide and look at the shared responsibility model in the cloud, the way it works is Amazon is responsible for the security of the cloud. Thinking back to that stack, we are responsible for the physical, the cooling, the power, the global infrastructure that makes up AWS. And customers are responsible for security in the cloud. That includes the uh, data uh, platform applications. And we provide tools that help you uh, manage that, the security and the responsibilities that you have. So thinking back, why is this such an improvement? Why is it so challenging uh, on-premise for security and compliance? Well, traditionally these on-premises stacks involve many different components and many different operational models. Um, it's different, difficult to automate that entire stack because of those different components, thinking about multiple types of networking or compute. And this model comes with high operational requirements that are time consuming and challenge. And they rarely provide that differentiation for your organization, what separates you from the rest that, uh, so you can focus again on your customers. So how does the cloud help with that? Um, the, the cloud helps because you can scale with increased visibility uh, and control, and you get to control where your data stored, you get uh, more improved fine grained control, and you can utilize tools like automation or infrastructure as code to help complete those controls and put those into place so that you can integrate multiple services along the stack and you get a more complete picture and more control. If you go to the next slide, we talk about how you can reduce those risks with those integrated services. And AWS tools are API driven and by having access to those APIs for every AWS service and using tools like guard duty that can monitor and protect your environment, all of this can improve your defense. Threats that may be detected by the systems can have responses automatically created and enforced. And the goal of all this is to create a really strong foundation that allows for a more well-architected environment that helps you serve your customers. The next slide. This is a snapshot of the Amazon services focusing on security, identity, and compliance. Um, I'm not gonna cover all of these, but when you think about uh, starting from a foundation of identity and access, who has control to what, all the way across to automated instant response and data protection, as well as compliance and uh, demonstration with uh, AWS Audit Manager. All of these tools can be used to help improve your foundation for a secure cloud environment. Next slide. And we, show, we also have quick starts available that are um, automated reference architectures that customers can deploy. For example, this is the HIPAA quick start that's focused on healthcare companies uh, creating a foundation that they can deploy their workloads that are capable of hosting and processing PHI. Uh, and you can see customers have uh, moved to AWS with great success. Uh, FINRA is a fraud and abuse um, monitoring. They moved, um, you know, they used to take three to four weeks to harden a server, and then they can do it in minutes now with automation. They process six terabytes of data using the cloud. And they were able, again, to differentiate what they, uh, where they focused, so they didn't have to worry about those, the server hardening or the overall operations. If you look at uh, our next example, ZocDoc, they migrated all into AWS in under 12 months. Uh, they were able to build a, a doctor scheduling uh, platform that was uh, HIPAA compliant from the beginning. And they were able to have better data controls and scale their operations and maintain that end-to-end -end visibility of that critical data. And that's what's really important to them. Uh, and the next slide shows our uh, one of our newer uh, customer case studies with virtual health, and they were able to migrate to the cloud, meeting their clients' needs for a more secure environment. And that was really important to them so that they could then scale their business and look forward to using increased uh, AWS technologies that would allow them to service their customers and what their customers want. Next slide. 
And finally, I wanna to touch upon a couple of credit programs that AWS offers to help organizations of all sizes. Uh, we have the Migration Acceleration Program that helps uh, industries migrate to the cloud and modernize on AWS. And we've helped hundreds of enterprise customers deliver large scale migrations with measurable outcomes. AWS has the most functionality, the largest and most vibrant community of customers and partners, uh, um, the most proven operational and security expertise and is innovating at the fastest clip, especially in new areas like machine learning, like I talked about. But we also have a program dedicated to startups called AWS Activate. And this provides startups the resources that they need to grow successfully in AWS. Uh, we do this by fundamentally understanding the uniqueness of each and every startup that applies for Activate and then personalizing those resources. Do things like technical support, training, um, and contextual pass to, uh, to opportunities for business and technical mentorship from Amazonians and startup peers. And this is all part of programs that we offer. Next slide. You know, to kind of summarize you know, the cloud journey, um, building the security into it, using AWS products and services from the ground up will help provide that improved and well-architected cloud experience. Using those tools to build securely, like I talked about, um, so that you don't have to make significant changes down the road by building that foundation that really helps uh, long-term and leveraging automation wherever possible. We talked a lot about um, things like having the automated response, but leveraging automation is also important because there's less chance of uh, a mistake or someone accidentally doing something. And finally, if you need more help, the AWS Partner Network and partners like DupliCloud are here to help you. And they can take, uh, again, that undifferentiated heavy lifting from a lot of the management side or a lot of the tool side. And with that, I'll turn things back over to Ian. Beautiful. Thank you so much, uh, Connor. I know AWS is a, you know, it always impresses me the number of, of services and, and programs that are available. Um, so any specific questions, feel free to, to ping Connor. Uh, and I'm going to transition now and introduce Venkit Tiro Vengadem. Uh, prior to founding Duplo Cloud, Venkit was one of the early engineers of Microsoft Azure. There, Venkit wrote significant parts of Azure Compute and was a founding engineer at Azure Networking until his departure in 2013. He saw Azure grow from 100 odd servers to millions of virtual machines managed by a few hundred engineers. After leaving Microsoft, he realized that such hyperscale automation techniques have not made their way outside of companies like AWS, Microsoft, and Google. This led Venkit to form DupoCloud with that goal of bringing the hyperscale automation techniques to Main Street IT. Over to you, Venkit. Hi, Ian. Thanks for the intro. Yeah. You can start with the slides. Thanks, everyone. I, uh, so I'll start with the introduction of Duplo Cloud. Duplo Cloud is, um, uh, is a DevSecOps platform, self-hosted and runs on your cloud account uh, and helps automate uh, a lot of the tasks and makes your journey of migrating as well as um, operating in, uh, in cloud easier. So um, DevOps automation for, um, uh, uh, for, for daily code deployments and then security and compliance uh, for various different standards, like for example, HIPAA, PCI, um, GDPR, are SOC 2 and so on. These are uh, our core um, uh, selling propositions. Um, we have dozens of customers, um, thousands of workloads. We have done like 20 plus compliance certifications. Uh, we have integrations with more or less uh, um, uh, all the core uh, Amazon services. Um, and so far, customers have done about uh, 3 million self-service deployments. So, so at a high level, you can think of Duplo Cloud as like if, if you need about like 6 to 12 months to put in place all the HIPAA PCI controls, uh, Duplo Cloud can put them in place um, in, a, in, a matter of, uh, in a matter of weeks. All right. So uh, next slide, Ian. So uh, now uh, in this webinar, let's focus a little bit more on the migration to the cloud. Uh, now, uh, Duplo Cloud, uh, I think I would basically say three fourths of our customers are the ones who are already in cloud and then we are helping them with security compliance and automation. And I would say about a quarter of the customers are the one who are new to cloud and they're migrating from uh, on-premises. So um, how does this migration look, looks like? Like what are the like, they're like basically four uh, migrations 
migration work streams. Uh, one is around app migration itself, wherein like how, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, just mostly focus on the application and that's the subject matter expertise that you require. Then there is the aspect of data migration, flat files, SQL data, and so forth. Then there is the infrastructure setup, which is all the configurations that you need to do in Amazon. And then finally, security and compliance. One could say that security and compliance is a setup or uh, is a subset of infrastructure setup, but given um, how uh, um, intense and uh, exhaustive it can be, I think it deserves to be a, a um, work stream on its own. Um, so because end of the day, I mean, if you're not in a regulated industry, you can still get going in AWS uh, um, with minimalistic security controls. So, so those are the four work streams. Um, next slide, Ian. So let's start with application migration. So we have seen about like four, uh, sorry, three different types of uh, um, uh, migration approaches. One is what we call as lift and shift. So here, wherein effectively what you do is that you have a virtual machine which is running in, or even a bare metal which is running in an on-premise data center. You lift and shift the entire operating system as it is, basically, right? Uh, if you're running a uh, um, Windows Server 2008 or a 2010 or a Linux Debian, whatnot, you basically just lift and shift it. Um, how do you do that? There are some techniques, like for example, Amazon has a software called, called Cloud India. There are like other softwares as well uh, who would help you um, actually go and replicate it. Now, the advantage of this is that there is basically no change that you need to do um, in your application or even configurations. It's sort of fastest way to uh, get you started. Uh, uh, but there are some significant uh, disadvantages in the sense that, I mean, the deployment is not cloud native. Uh, Amazon will not recognize the operating system. It's missing the agents that are required to monitor the health of the system. So it, it can be pretty hard to maintain uh, if things go down and so on. So this actually used to be uh, um, a pretty um, common approach till about like four to five years back. But given all the disadvantages that we're talking about, we're seeing less and less of this. Uh, but again, I mean, if you have like lots and lots of VM and you have an urgency to move because the data center is shutting down or something, I think people do this. Uh, then there is the other approach wherein um, you redeploy the application on the operating system, which is provided by Amazon, the virtual machines. So you spin up the virtual, you mirror the uh, environment in the sense that you spin up the virtual machines uh, with an operating system. And sometimes you even go to a newer one, like your application may be running on server 2012 uh, R2, but you would actually spin up a 2016 or a 2019 Windows server. And then uh, once that's up, then you would actually log in um, install the IIS servers and then actually install the application. Now, this is better than lift and shift um, in our opinion um, because the application is not like 100% cloud native, but it's still middle ground. You can still monitor the system. The operating system is recognized by the cloud platform, uh, but, but there's still some work to be done. Uh, in terms of an ongoing operations and making it more efficient. So, so, uh, so that's that. Then finally, the third one is that this is, so, so to speak, a more aggressive one, wherein what you do is that you repackage the application into a Docker container. You could even call it lift and shift from a VM into a container, and then, um, and then you deploy it into the cloud, and then you can use services like ECS, Kubernetes, and so forth. Uh, this is closest to cloud native. Uh, it's the most automated. Uh, it's really um, gets you going uh, and then it's easy to scale and maintain and so forth. Uh, but the disadvantage, of course, is that, I mean, there is um, a reasonable amount of subject matter expertise that you require both in terms of containers and infrastructure. And uh, if your applications are like sort of stateful, they write uh, data on the disk and so on, they're using some of the legacy technologies, it can get tricky to containerize things. And sometimes it may not even be viable to containerize them. So those are like sort of the application migration approaches. And I think fortunately we have uh, um, uh, the next two speakers, they have like one of them has done containerization and the other one has taken the redeploy approach. So, so I think you'll hear more about their experiences and so on. So next slide, Ian. Uh, so yeah, I think now uh, once we are through the application uh, migration work stream, uh, we can talk about data migration. By the way, in application migration, most of the subject matter expertise is related to the application that by and large comes from the um, organization itself, the clients itself. Uh, then there is the data migration. And uh, um, let, let's assume that if you are talking about, let's say 10 terabytes of data, um, you can migrate it over in what's known as like sort of a live migration, an online migration. 
Uh, there are like two types of data that you would want to migrate, flat files, and then there is SQL. There's also no SQL, and then uh, um, there are specialized migration techniques to do that. So in terms of flight, flat files, what you do is that you set up a dedicated connection, uh, and then you start a differential copy. Let's say you have five terabytes of data, you start copying it over, over a dedicated link, maybe it takes a week or so, uh, and then you keep repeating it. So with tools like Rich Copy, what they're able to do is uh, they're able to find out uh, what's the uh, delta and they just copy just that much. So you don't shut down your application in on-premise, you keep going, but you keep uh, doing a differential copy again and again so that eventually you catch up. Uh, and then your delta is like so small, you take a downtime uh, towards the end and then like sort of copy it over. Then uh, there is SQL and SQL, there are a few techniques. One is you can take a full backup and then um, you can have a differential backup copied over. Uh, the full backup will take time to copy it and then the differential backup takes lesser and lesser. And then there's also a technique around like live replication wherein you can create a mirror SQL server uh, and, and then the data gets uh, mirrored over the period of time and then finally you cut over. There are also like uh, issues if you have really like tens of, peta uh, tens of terabytes of data, then you have to use something like a hardware solution. You ship like a box um, called, uh, if I'm not wrong, it's called Snowball. Uh, uh, it's like an Amazon service. It gets to your data center, you connect it to the servers, copy the data, ship it back into Amazon, they'll plug it in and then they'll get the data onto the cloud and then you go from there. And then maybe you do the differential copies after that. So, so those are like the techniques in terms of the data migration. Uh, and primarily in summary, I'll basically say the various different techniques really uh, are around how to minimize downtime uh, and how to make this migration the fastest. Um, next slide, Ian. So now uh, let's come to infrastructure setup. Uh, I would say that this is where I think sort of Duplo Cloud comes in. Uh, so infrastructure setup is like, okay, how, what should be the topology in AWS? So we'll dig a little bit deeper uh, in this work stream. So what you would do is that, uh, and this could be either a migration or it could be like even a brand new uh, setup in the cloud. So what you would do is that you would draw out what is known as a uh, application blueprint. Uh, by and large, you will have high level constructs around, okay, how many availability zones do you want to use? What's the, uh, how many VPC? how uh, resources are spread across public and private. Uh, like, for example, you'll say all uh, most of the servers are on the private network, whatever is required is exposed via a load balancer, and then there is a WAF in front, you want to have VPNs in place and so forth. So you would start with this high-level application architecture, which would typically be done by somebody who has a reasonable understanding of application and is uh, uh, has a good understanding of AWS, like, uh, like a solutions architect. Okay, next slide, Ian. So once you have that in place, you have to go through uh, a series of steps uh, to automate uh, all the uh, all the tasks. So you'd start with base infrastructure, which includes your VPC, subnets, availability zone, VPNs. Then you have your app services. This is where you talk about your virtual machine, SQL Server, 3 days, or Elasticsearch. Uh, um, and this is where also you talk about backup, disaster recovery, and so on. So some people call it like platform services. So you have to have all of that in place. Then you talk about app provisioning and the automation around that. Now here again, it sort of depends on what approach you have taken. Like for example, if you're doing containers, then you will put in place ECS or EKS. Uh, um, or if you have like Debian packages, you might want to do some salt. Uh, um, and then uh, here is where you deal with auto scaling, DNS, load balancer, um, uh, and so forth. If you have any serverless applications, you'll have some Lambda. But in the context of migration, I think it's largely virtual machines, Linux packages, and containers. So once you have that in place, then you set up logging and monitoring uh, for diagnostics, and then you just set CI, CD. Now, coming back to the app migration approach, you could say that, let's say, if you have taken a lift and shift, so then I would say, by and large, you're dealing with only one and two and maybe a little bit of app monitoring. Uh, then if you have done a redeploy or a, 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 on, a, on a new virtual machine, then you are dealing with like one, two, and three. Uh, that's the layers that you have to automate, maybe a little bit of app monitoring. And finally, if you are taking the containerized approach, you have to do like all five of them. So, so that's like your, uh, 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 that's how you cut out your tasks based on like what uh, um, uh, approach that you've taken for app migration. And uh, as you can see, the more you, uh, um, uh, uh, 
like the more complex, like for example, the more work you have to do, but of course it has to, it will give you those benefits as well. Now, um, across the board, you have to put in a lot of security controls across like all areas. Uh, so, um, and uh, you could do what is known as, um, uh, uh, what, what is known as uh, table stake uh, security controls. Uh, uh, but uh, if you are in a regulated industry, you have to follow uh, uh, the prescriptive standards like Connor talked about, like the HIPAA guide. Uh, and then there are similar guides for PCI, HITRA. So at a high level, like each one of them, like PCI has like 79 controls, HITRA has 81, HIPAA has 50. And in fact, like it takes about like six to 12 months to get all of these controls in place, like take do like maybe a few days for each control and then that's how much time and then you also have to do all the devops automation and that's how much time it takes so 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 in the sense i think we are quite intimately familiar with like how much time it takes people to do all of these controls uh, and uh, um, that's also validated by the case studies that we've been hearing um, next slide so if you have to dig deeper and you start cutting out the, all the tasks that you have to do based on just few application services that you use, let's say virtual machine containers, S3, um, and so on. So you will see that this is the split about like half of the tasks are uh, security tasks. Uh, and then this is the split of the rest of them. So there is like platform services or the app infrastructure is 66 and so forth. So, um, so it takes like a really, really a long time. Uh, I mean, it has like really long implementation cycle. Uh, and if you really have to automate well, you need to have good coding skills and you also need to have uh, infosec expertise and you need to have operations expertise. And of course, I mean, doing uh, these things can be quite error prone and non-compliant and require you lots and lots of resources. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's, that's how it's done today, by the way. And that's how much time it sort of takes. And that's also one of the reasons why most service providers uh, and partners uh, um, try to treat it more like a time and material. Uh, um, this thing or what they would do is that if not time and material they would sort of buffer it so much that uh, uh, it it has like all all these man days um, I mean we've seen these man days run into like hundreds and even thousands for um, dev, dev set tops for really small infrastructures so um, which is pretty common so now uh, with Duplo Cloud I think what we've been able to do is that based on our backgrounds working for Amazon and Azure uh, uh, we know how, um, I mean, end of the day, Amazon and Azure run millions of workloads and you saw all the various compliance standards that Connor showed you. How is it that with just a few people, they're able to meet all of that run millions and millions of workloads because they have access to superior automation techniques, which are not available to Main Street, uh, mainstream IT. Uh, and we being one of the original authors of public cloud, uh, I think we, we are able to bring a lot of these automation techniques and apply it at a layer of abstraction on top of Amazon. Uh, and uh, in, you can go back um, uh, uh, to the previous slide. Uh, and we are able to apply it at a layer of abstraction on top of Amazon. Uh, so in summary, uh, effectively, you know, Connor talked about the shared services model and he clearly articulated where Amazon stops and where your responsibility starts. And we are extending that further, basically. And next slide. So um, how we are doing that, uh, Ian, we can go to the next slide. How we are doing that is that now we are saying is that, look, you know what's the shared security responsibility model. These are all the things that you need to do. And then you bring in uh, a product like Duplo Cloud uh, 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 with our services, and then we'll take care of all configurations related to um, Amazon, for example, and the security and compliance. So effectively, you get to focus on your application and data and anything and everything related to Amazon is covered uh, um, uh, using this particular, uh, using the software where all of these tasks are uh, automated. So um, that's the principle. Uh, and uh, that's how uh, Duplo Cloud sort of works. And because it's all automated in the form of a platform, um, it's purely, a, a, Ian, we can go to the next slide. Uh, it's, it's, it's really a, 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 a makes it like so much more faster. Um, so now if we were to talk about like sort of the, in summarize the execution uh, of a migration process, um, what you do is that you set up infrastructure, you put in place security and compliance, uh, you do your first set of data migration. Uh, this is the part that you will take care, take the longest, then you bring in the application. 
uh, um, then you stop the application, you do another data migration, which will take much smaller because the core of the data is done. You only have differential data. So once you have done that, and then you go live, uh, right? So th this is the process uh, that you would come up with. Uh, um, infrastructure and security is done by um, DupliCloud software, uh, um, and, uh, we, uh, and you are responsible for the uh, data migration, app migration, and so on. And then if you um, uh, work with us for our managed services offering, um, you would have, uh, um, we'll assist you with the rest of the process as well. So um, that's the execution, how it looks like. Um, now, uh, I think I wanted to basically sort of uh, um, uh, emphasize on the fact is that because we have these automations in place, we are ready to go. We don't really have to look at like what needs to be automated in the infrastructure, what compliance standards that you have to follow. It's a, price, it's a business model, which is fixed cost purely based on the number of nodes that you have. Uh, effectively. Uh, in, in the context of migration, that would be your virtual machines and containers. So uh, so that's sort of like how we are able to do it. And then you'll be surprised like how fast we are able to do it. Now, um, in order to help further, uh, we have partnered with AWS. And with each of their AWS credit offerings, we have added a Duplo Cloud offering. Like, for example, if you are a member of Activate, you would get two months of Duplo Cloud free. And if you are in Migrate, then you again get two months free. One is paid for by AWS, uh, and then one is uh, um, we are offering it. So, so yeah, I mean, uh, um, hopefully this, uh, this conversation was useful for you. You got a gist of like what migration looks like. Um, and, uh, and yeah, uh, happy to chat more if, uh, uh, if you have questions and so forth. Awesome. Thanks so much, Venkit. And feel, the, feel free to fire some questions through the Q&A. Um, moving along, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Ajay Gulati, CTO of uh, CamiVision. Uh, Ajay is a technologist and serial entrepreneur who has been at the forefront of AI and cloud technology for more than 15 years. He built the cloud startup ZeroStack from the ground up, uh, seeing it through to its uh, exit and acquisition by Lenovo. He has taken his experience from this and is applying it as he builds Vision AI solutions, currently with more than a dozen patents to his name. Ajay, wanted to uh, have you hop on, and can you start by telling us a little bit about Kami? Hello, hi, Ian. Glad to be here. So Kami, essentially, we are a Vision AI software company that works with a lot of different hardware cameras, and we provide the software stack, and we work with multiple different uh, camera partners. Now, if you go actually one more slide further, one thing that there is a big trend in the market right now, which is about usage of more and more videos for different use cases. I think even in our own lives, I remember four or five years ago, we weren't using as many camera devices at home. Now at my home, I have three cameras with a doorbell. When I walk in the neighborhood, there is a lot of cameras and doorbells and everything being deployed. And it essentially leads to two big problems. One, every camera produces a lot of data that needs to be stored someplace. And second, people want to be able to search through and get some interesting insights from this data. And we talk to a lot of customers who basically are in two different buckets. One, they are struggling basically to make any uh, meaningful value out of data or get some interesting events out of data, which is where AI comes in. And second, there are a set of customers who have some existing solution, but they are looking to add camera and AI as part of that existing solution itself. So our main vision is that how do we enable more and more use cases with camera where we can help with AI, we can help with reducing the amount of data that is being stored, as well as being able to run some AI algorithms to convert a 24 hour stream into maybe 50 or 100 or 200 interesting events. What an interesting uh, company. And I mean, my mind instantly goes to the use case in the cloud. Can you tell us a bit more about the, uh, the Vision AI platform, about the product? Sure. So essentially, um, and previously, we were focusing mainly on the cameras that are being sold in the consumer market and we provide the software stack, but uh, the hardware comes from other vendors. What we have been doing in the last, I would say six to nine months 
is converting our software stack into a vision AI platform. Now, what do I mean by a AI platform? If you think of any uh, computer vision-based solution, there are certain things that need to be part of any solution. You have to have cameras and you need to have a way to manage those cameras. You have to have users you have to store videos and image, you have to handle different AI models, you need to have access control. And all of these things need to be part of any solution irrespective of the AI model. So what we are essentially doing is we are taking what we have built and repackaging that as a platform so that we can enable more and more use cases on top of it so that everybody who wants a vision AI solution doesn't have to build the whole thing end to end they can use our platform, put in their AI model, and they can actually have a solution very quickly. That's awesome. So you guys weren't always on AWS. Why, uh, why, where did this migration start? And, and tell me a little bit about that journey and the challenges you faced. Yeah, that's right. It's, uh, so we essentially, when we started and we had deployed most of our infrastructure on Ali Cloud, and that is actually across different continents. So for US customers, we have a Ali Cloud US deployment. For Europe, we have a deployment in Europe. The thesis for AWS migration came from two or three different reasons. One, as we started looking into building this vision AI platform, we realized that we need to leverage more and more higher level services. And AWS seems to provide a lot more services that we were looking for, and also specifically in the AI space. Second, we have been working with some of the large customers who happen to be on AWS or who want us to be on AWS for one reason or the other. So that makes it much easier for us to be on AWS and work with those customers and partners. And third, I would say part of it is also a little bit on the people's expertise. It's, I think people we have, they have more expertise on AWS. We are able to work with great partners like Duplo Cloud that make the transition also easier. So I would say given the combination of all these factors and the fact that AWS also has been very supportive in terms of the general technical support and uh, help with some uh, cost effectiveness, it was a uh, no brainer decision to move to them. Awesome, what, what was tough about, uh, about, about specifically your product in the context of, of the cameras and cloud? So I think main thing, uh, Ian, in our case, I'll tell you, when we were thinking of the migration, there are a couple of things that we need to take care of. One is building the infrastructure on AWS from scratch, because we had nothing uh, deployed there previously. Second, we do follow a lot of industry standards uh, that our customers rely on, given that we have uh, consumer data and other critical data. And then next was the data migration and app migration. Now, one thing that really Duplo Cloud was able to help with is make it easier to set up the infrastructure without us having to spend a lot of time and effort on that. And the second thing that I really liked with Duplo was the fact that there is a concept of a tenant that lets us isolate all the different resources between uh, different deployments like dev and staging and production. And I don't have to worry about a lot of fine-grained uh, access control, which believe me, as great as AWS is, it's just they have too many controls and it's not easy to actually do all that uh, by yourself. And the fact that infrastructure and the security layer were handled by Duplo, that makes it easier for us to focus on app and data the biggest challenge in my mind comes actually in the data migration because typically the data is spread across multiple different databases these days like it could be relational it could be NoSQL database it could be object store and that is where i think the big challenge that we face and um, i think for most enterprises i do expect um, that would be a critical case to minimize the downtime one more thing that we did as part of the migration is we did containerize all of our services, which were initially running in VMs. And now we are running a full container based uh, architecture on AWS, 
which makes a lot of operational uh, tasks easier. That's awesome. What, uh, what's next as you look forward, uh, Ajay? So I think next what we are um, doing is now that we are converting our software stack into a platform, there are two, I would say, big use cases that we are handling. One is that we are making it easier to build computer vision AI applications very quickly. So typically what would take almost 12 to 18 months for a company to do, we can do it in four to six weeks. And second, I feel that building AI models is becoming easier and easier given all the improvements in the libraries and other support from different vendors. And it's not easy for AI developers to actually build an interesting model and go and monetize it unless it is for a very big market. And using our platform, we want to enable these developers to basically upload their model, make it accessible to our customers. And if our customers find it useful, then we can do revenue sharing with AI developers. This is the same as you know what e-commerce enabled, which is the long tail of e-commerce products, where even if a product sells not a large number of quantities, you can still sell it on e-commerce, but it won't sell on the regular shelf space. Similarly, we can enable the use case where if a AI model, even if it is useful for, let's say, a niche use case, where you cannot build a company on it, but using a platform like ours, you can still take it to market and you can capture uh, those customers and help them. Cool, makes a ton of sense. Well, thanks so much, Ajay. Uh, really appreciate the time. Um, I'm gonna bring on our, our next customer and then Ajay, you'll probably be able to join me for a couple minutes at the end as we look at, uh, at some Q&A. Sure. Thanks, Ajay. Up next, we've got uh, Sabari Valdesumaranian. He's an IT professional with over 20 years of experience delivering best-in-class software, leading high-performance teams, and is an expert in the e-commerce field. He has held various positions in software development and building and maintaining IT infrastructure. He holds a master's in information systems and is the director of technology at Steve Lines and Wallpaper, which is a leading e-commerce company in the home decoration space. I caught up with Sabari over the weekend. Thankfully, he can be here today to share his mig migration story. Sabari, I'll hand it over to you. You can take it from here. All right. Thank you, Ian. <clears throat> so, um, once again, my name is Sabari. I'm the director of technology with Steve's Blinds. Uh, we are an e-commerce company uh, selling blinds and wallpaper direct to the consumer. We are a 60-year-old company, and we've been successful over uh, three generations of ownership. Uh, we are a small company with less than 50 employees with uh, around 20 million in uh, annual revenues. Our technology stack is uh, we are a Microsoft shop. All our applications are built in uh, .NET framework with uh, Microsoft SQL Server backend. All our applications are custom built. They're all developed in-house by engineering teams. So in, uh, in the year 2016, we, uh, we had 25 plus servers in a on-prem data center in Southfield, Michigan, and we wanted to move to the cloud. And uh, we evaluated both AWS and Azure at that point of time. One challenge was we didn't have uh, in-house resources uh, with knowledge of AWS or any of the cloud platforms. And the consultants that we found to help us with the migration, they were prohibitively, prohibitively expensive. Some of their quotes with time and material was unbounded. Even with the fixed price, it was still uh, unaffordable. Rackspace fit the bill at that time because they provided professional services in addition to the infrastructure. It came as a complete uh, managed service package. So we successfully uh, went sunset our uh, on-prem uh, data center and we moved to Rackspace. In 2019, we started a, a brand new project called Contact My Politician. So this one, this project, we built it from the ground up with, uh, with wanting it to be a, a cloud native application. This way we could take advantage of uh, AWS. So we built it in .NET Core with, My, with a MySQL uh, backend. So at this point of time, we evaluated Duplo and their uh, 
and their uh, software platform, which helped us containerize our application. And uh, we deployed this in AWS with little or no issues at all. And uh, it, it reduced our uh, lead time to go live, go to the market by a, by a great uh, deal. And uh, the advantage of uh, uh, using Duplo was we didn't have to have a lot of uh, in-depth understanding and knowledge of the uh, AWS platform because uh, Duplo made it easy and uh, simple for us. Once we got comfortable with AWS and uh, and with our experience with contact my politician, in the year 2020, we decided to switch our e-commerce website, which is Steve's Blinds and Wallpaper, and its applications to AWS. We had a, a minor challenge with the prices going up at Rackspace, and uh, with the credits given by AWS, it seemed attractive to make the switch. And uh, since we already had experience with uh, contact my politician and uh, using Duplo for that migration, uh, we thought uh, we were ready to uh, make the migration in 2020. So once we made the decision, we, we faced a few challenges and I'm here to uh, talk about how we faced those challenges and how we overcame those, those challenges. One of the biggest issues that we had when migrating AWS was the question of how much would the infrastructure and the services cost us in AWS? Even with the tools offered by AWS, it wasn't easy to figure out a line item level cost of each of the product and services. How much would my monthly bill at AWS, what would it be? It was very hard to get, uh, get an idea of what that would be. So, <clears throat> With with a partner with with the AWS partners, and uh, we in working with Duplo, they were able to break it down into a clear cut, concise Excel sheet saying that for your needs, this is going to be the list of items, these EC2 instances, these file servers, these load balancers, and so on and so forth, and this was going to be your total cost. And this fixed cost migration model that uh, they provided made the decision a lot more easier as uh, all that was rolled into our uh, bill. The second challenge was, as uh, Connor's slide uh, illustrated it, AWS has a ton of services. What were these services that were appropriate for us? EC2 instances, Okay, what size, what flavors? Load balancers, so we have four public facing endpoints. How many load balancers do we need? Can we use a similar load balance, one load balancer for multiple endpoints? We had a robust, uh, I mean, at Raxel, we had dedicated hardware for our load balancer, firewalls, and uh, servers. So what would be the equivalent in AWS? What about a web application firewall? Uh, uh, e-commerce platform like ours, we are subject to all kinds of attacks from all across the world. So we wanted geo IP filtering where we only wanted traffic from the US and Canada. How do we achieve that with the AWS WAF? Do we move our file servers to uh, S3? What do we do? Another big challenge that we had was we, we have, since we sell uh, thousands of products of blinds and wallpaper, we have uh, product images close to some 2.5 million files, which is a little less than a terabyte in uh, disk size. Should we uh, move, redeploy all of this with or without application changes, move these to S3, or do we bring along our uh, file servers to AWS and then uh, go, go with a phased approach to, to migrate that and convert that to S3? Some of these challenges were difficult, but uh, we were able to work through those. We were able to uh, surmount those challenges. So given all the challenges and, uh, and our lead time, we decided to redeploy our application with no configuration changes. Essentially, we stood up servers at AWS, the operating system with IAS web servers, with SQL server, 
and we uh, set up our uh, tenants, the VPC, we created the security groups. And once all the servers are provisioned in AWS, then we started the migration of the data. Once we migrated the data, we had like a, a standby environment up and running. We started testing it. And uh, then we laid on the security controls and compliance standards as uh, we had to comply with the uh, PCI DSS standards. Uh, finally, we were able to apply the security controls and the compliance standards. In general, by uh, using uh, AWS and Duplo, we were able to hand off the challenges of dealing with infrastructure to our partner, Duplo and AWS. And this allows us to primarily focus on what we do best. What we do best, like we have uh, integrations with our uh, vendors. We send EDI files. We have uh, integrations with Payment Gateway. We we are able to add features to our uh, platform and our product and our services, and uh, which allows us to focus on our core competency. And now that uh, we've been on uh, AWS for uh, Steve's clients and contact my politician for all, almost two years. Now now we are looking at uh, improving and modernizing our uh, applications. We are looking at uh, containerizing our uh, Steve's Blinds application, which using uh, Duplo's DevOps uh, platform, which uh, allows us to deploy and uh, get a seamless DevOps uh, uh, workflow. We are looking to migrate our uh, file servers into S3 buckets. We are already using the CDN available with AWS, which has reduced our uh, page load times and uh, content deliverability. We have hundreds of jobs that run on a daily basis uh, for our back office operations. So we're looking at uh, how we can use AWS serverless computing for this. And uh, we're looking to use more of the uh, cloud native services, like a lot of the automation and uh, uh, a lot of the various features offered by uh, AWS. So, that uh, in a nutshell was uh, our challenges and uh, that's how we were able to uh, surmount our challenges and uh, complete our journey to the public cloud. Thank you, Ian. Awesome. Yeah, thanks so much, Savari. I'm gonna invite all the panelists to hop on now. Uh, feel free to, to turn on your, your calendars uh, or your calendars, your, uh, your video. Uh, I know we don't have a, a ton of time left, so I'm checking the, the Q&A here. Um, and uh, we didn't have a ton of questions come in, which is uh, probably fortunate considering our time. So I think what I'd like to do is just give give each person a minute uh, to share sort of any closing thoughts. Um, I know um, it was interesting to hear uh, uh, Jay talk about the the data as being one big challenge to migration. So migrations or otherwise, um, share your your final thoughts. I'll give you one minute each. And we will start, uh, let's do it in the order. So let's go Connor first, and then we'll go over to uh, Benke. Thanks, Ian. Yeah, so to summarize, I talked a lot about how AWS has the services and technology that can help. But one thing we've, I also want to point out that we didn't talk about was what we've seen be success, or successful, what drives success for migrations. And that's uh, a top-down um, culture that's driven from leadership to adopt and migrate to the cloud by building out that um, from the building that out from the executive leadership model down and building a cloud governance or cloud center of excellence really helps drive that success. And when you're ready, you know, like I said, AWS and partners are here to talk and here to help. Love it. Thanks, Connor. Over to you, Venkat. Uh, hi, uh, I think one of the things that we sort of heard is that um, AWS is pretty clear in terms of the shared security model and the boundaries where they stop and where the customers start. Um, uh, and, and then we've seen a lot of customers be, uh, um, being overwhelmed and it can be a daunting task to put together uh, and fulfill that shared security model. But 
I primarily wanted to basically convey that there are actually a lot of good uh, tools and technologies like Duplo Cloud and others in the partner and then and it doesn't really have to be a daunting uh, task and it shouldn't take like six months to uh, um, uh, one year to put in place controls like PCI, HIPAA and so forth and, and notwithstanding all the effort that you have to put in place to maintain them uh, both in terms of uh, manpower and time. So, so yeah, I think the technology is there, the automation is there. Uh, I think we just have to adopt it. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Ajay, over to you. So one thing I would like to mention that I have seen actually many organizations do the migration where I think initially they focus too much on migration and then they try to focus on security and compliance and they say, okay, let's do that once we have migrated over because that's a later problem. And I think that becomes a uh, challenge if you don't do it from the day one. So one thing that I would recommend is when you are thinking of the migration, try to plan in the security and compliance from the day one. And one thing that I actually liked about Duplo's approach as well is most companies, they do the migration and then they buy solutions to scan their environment, tell them what the problems are, and then they will go and fix the problems. And in case of Duplo, the nice thing was that since Duplo is in the provisioning path, it guarantees that from the day one, everything is secure and compliant. So I don't have to worry about running all the scanning tools and other stuff. So I feel more and more, I actually expect the uh, security vendors to start providing solutions where it, it starts from provisioning rather than uh, later on. And I think similarly, as you know, in healthcare, they say prevention is better than cure. It's better to prevent problems than going and taking medicine to fix it. Awesome. So Bari, final thoughts. So yeah, I think uh, the uh, credits given by AWS for uh, small business like us, it was a huge uh, game changer for us to make the switch. And uh, I think we would like to evaluate more of the uh, options and opportunities available to uh, use a, a lot more of the AWS services. That's our goal for the next uh, year or so. Awesome. Well, I want to thank uh, each one of our panelists for joining us today. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time and sharing your thoughts. Uh, and have a wonderful rest of your day, everybody. Thanks, guys. Okay. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye.